So <clears throat> I just want to quickly run through a couple of things that we're doing at Al Jazeera and just talk a bit about the changes we've seen in the industry from a broadcaster's perspective. Um, we've been living through these changes, changes that Leonard Brody had spoken about earlier. This is something that myself and my group has very, been very heavily involved in trying to understand what it means to our business, um, how best to capitalize on it, and where we should be positioning ourselves. So, is it up yet? Fantastic. So, the first thing, um, this is Mr. Rupert Mellon, some of you may have heard of him. Um, he is the news, you know, he was just the book that recently came out, the man who owns the news. And Rupert said in 2006, around the time when he was buying MySpace, to find something comparable, you have to go back 500 years to the printing press, the birth of mass media, technology shifting away from the editors, the publishers, the establishment, the media elite. It's not the people who are taking control. And this very much goes to what uh, my colleague was speaking about earlier. Yet I think this euphoria that we had with technology and the opportunities that technology would bring us, I think we've lived through it with the rise of this next internet boom that was just cut short with the financial crisis. And many of us in this industry got caught up in it and were jumping around to see how we could season it. And at the same time, this was a time when our established industry business models were collapsing, newspapers, circulation is dropping, everyone's cutting budgets, uh, their foreign operations have been closed down, everybody's suing everybody in this business. So we're not sure at this point whether this change, uh, the desire of technology being able to save this industry is necessarily true. And what we've seen, even with Mr. Murdoch saying this, and what MySpace has brought to his company, once MySpace is over, it's not even mentioned again in Musical. And Murdoch doggedly pursued the Wall Street Journal, and that became what he wanted. Because at the end of the day, Murdoch was a newspaper proprietor. And, that was, and there was value in the journal for him more than anything else, something that, would, that he'd been pursuing for years and years and years. So that's not to say that technology is not important, and papers are, but it really comes down to the brand and what that brings you. So of course, uh, just to prove how quickly news spreads and how fast you need to be in this business, this is the same picture that Leonard showed earlier of the US Airways flight that had crashed into the Hudson River. And uh, as I said, this was an event that occurred the first time it was reported by, by somebody on Twitter, um, which is a microblogging service. He had seen it. I was actually awake when this happened. It was on Thursday night at about uh, just 12 o'clock Doha time. I just got home from work. And uh, you know, everybody was talking about this event. This plane went down. This was the first report that came in saying, it's crazy, this plane crashed into the Hudson. But not only was it a text message that came out to inform us, it was also a picture. So this was the first picture that came out because he was on the ferry that was going out to pick the people um, who were on the plane waiting. And this was his immediacy, this event that took place immediately, someone could report it and bring it back. Now of course this is just the start. And it may not even be the start because the events aren't the start of news. The event is the event and there's lots around it. There's context, there's understanding, there's depth. So while it's important for us to capture these events and to be quick in ca capturing them, we shouldn't, forget, we shouldn't misunderstand this as this being all there is for news. Because the events and bringing these events and being the first with the event isn't necessarily meaning you have the best coverage. So this is a cartoon that I like to pick up um, and to show whenever I sp uh, speak about the changes in our industry. And this really speaks to the heart of some of these changes that technology brings, some of the changes that the way that we interact with uh, news the way that young people interact with it. You know, the, the, the kid asks his dad, have you seen the news? And he says, no, I haven't watched CNN. He says, what's CNN? And this is a reality today. You know, young people don't go down to these destination news sites to find out what's happening. You know, they'll go through the aggregators, they'll go through their friends and through their Facebook, and that's how they get the news. The destination itself isn't the destination anymore. They might have landed on CNN to read the story, but they might not have ever been to the front page of CNN. And this really causes a crisis of relevance in our industry. Because you have to understand who, who are we? We're just providing these random pages of information. What makes us different from Sky and from you know, our next competitor and Joe Blog setting up down the road? So it really asks, what makes you unique? And this is a question that all news outlets need to answer. What makes us unique? What differentiates us? And what's the value we add? Because eventually everybody could carry the same wire story Everybody eventually could carry the same picture that's uploaded to Flickr or same messages on Twitter. So it needs to be something more than this. And you know, so these are some of the industry challenges. You know, Viacom was suing YouTube for content going up. The Associated Press was suing Drudge Retort um, for quotes of their stories. Ad prices are falling. Bureaus are being closed. And these are very real.
problems our industry faces and the financial crisis just can make them worse. Now, we shouldn't mistake the financial crisis and the impact of the crisis and what it's having in this industry with these all being technical shifts and shifts brought about by technology. Some of these are maybe precipitated by it and some of them may just be purely financial models that are collapsing um, and just maybe people are not interested in specific types of news anymore, specific brands of news and they're losing out new people entrance into the market. So uh, I just want to show you a quick clip by John Stewart talking about this phenomena of citizen journalism. Sorry, is it well, but in television, things are obviously much more vital, much more uh, happening. Matter of fact, the standard bearer for cable news, CNN, uh, has an important question to ask viewers. Ever wish you could say, I report for CNN? I'm going to go with no. Here's how you can join the most trusted name in news. When you have pictures or video of breaking news or cool stories from your part of the world, go to CNN.com and click on that report. Yes, CNN wants you to spare them what is currently the most arduous part of what they do, reporting. <laughs> and not just anywhere. Apparently they want you to get as close as possible to an exploding building during a hurricane. Gee, this assignment looks dangerous. You know what would be good for that story? John Q. Schmuck. <laughs> and what quality of a reportage makes it to CNN's air? Here's how Ryan Kingsbury joined the most trusted name in news. Ryan shot his photographs after Ernesto crashed into Kill Devil Hill. Hmm. And here's a picture of Ryan and his mom in front of the world's biggest ball of twine. It has no news value, but we've got 24 hours to kill. Now, I admit, amateur journalists have risen to the challenge in the past. There was the Zapruder film, the Rodney King video, the Paris Hilton expose on faulty mattresses. <laughs> but come on, CNN, you're asking for a lot here. I mean, what's the payoff for us? It's fast and easy. If you use your pictures or video on there, you can tell your friends, I will do it for CNN. <laughs> Just think of it. Of the stuff that they get, it's not going to really be uh, hard news. I, I have a feeling this kind of uh, invitation gets mostly submissions like this. It's just in. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, this is pretty self explanatory. This, you know, we shouldn't be caught up with this euphoria of what it is and uh, sort of miss the point of what reporting really is about. So, you know, one of the ways, obviously, all this change is happening, and it's all just here. Um, the way we've initially understood this change um, is that we as Al Jazeera on the right hand side of the screen where you see the iPod and the TV and the blogs and you know, phones and all of these things, these are these distribution platforms. And as Al Jazeera we need to be on all of them. So, we, you know, and essentially what we're saying is if you're a viewer of Al Jazeera, a potential viewer, you should be able to receive us anywhere. How you want, in the format that you want, wherever you want. Um, and we're going to make our content available through all these mechanisms. And currently, we're on all these platforms, you can get us anywhere. Um, and that's just a really a distribution problem. It's not anything fancy to do with the heart of journalism, it's just how do you get content out. The second part on the left hand side is how do we bring content in. And that is really what um, the crux of the matter now is. What um, now public is trying to solve, and everybody in the industry is trying to solve, and I report is trying to solve, is how do we get new content in. Um, and these are user generated content, uh, I hate the term, but you know, all these sort of things. Um, how do we really get out there and find what's being said online, what, where people are uploading, just because the cost of production has dropped so dramatically. Everybody who's got a phone in this room, and because of Twitter, I know everybody's phone here can take video and photos and you can upload them to the web and do all these fancy things with them. So, how do we position ourselves in this ecosystem and really become an ecosystem? Because when we put the content out, it's going to prompt you to create new content, and you're going to create content, and it's going to prompt us to create content around it. So, just some of the ways that we try to deal with this. Um, we have something called Old Israel Labs, where we try to address um, new initiatives and look at what's new in our profession, how we can position ourselves. 
So, you know, um, you can go to NEV, so those of you the net. If you need to look at any of this, it's, you know, where we play around with Facebook and YouTube um, and Twitter and anything that's cool, anything that's trending on the online world, we're trying to get involved and see how we position ourselves and how do we take our content to our audience. It's not enough now to sit back and say, everybody should come and watch us and come to our website. So we're going to go out and say, where are people? Where do they gather online? And if they're gathering on YouTube, we're going to go out to YouTube and say, here's our content, you may be interested. And we're going to try to create specific content targeted there. Um, so, so YouTube page, for example, um, we've been using Twitter. This is a microblogging service that everybody's been talking about, which basically you can send a quick text message off your phone and it gets distributed to any number of people who are following you and who sign up online. So what we've done with our Gaza coverage over the last 22 days is we've been sending out immediate breaking alerts of what's going on in Gaza, 140 characters long, so people can immediately find out what's the new developments. And these developments are happening hour by hour, minute by minute. So there's you know, nearly 6,000 people who are following us on Twitter who get this, these news alerts, updates, written by our journalists on the website. Um, we've been experimenting with news visualization. How do we show news in new manners and new forms which adds insight and depth to whatever we're doing? So can we map this data in an interesting way? So when you can go in there and explore it and see what does it really mean um, when we're looking at this war in Gaza? Where's, where are these bomb attacks taking place? Where, how, what, is the, what is the Gaza Strip exactly? We're talking about these things sometimes, it doesn't really explain it. And you know, another layer of information to go out and to examine it um, and to see when a rocket goes into Israel, where is that? What's the impact? When, it, when the Israelis go into Gaza, what's the impact of that? And visually, you can see the differences in this. And visually, so you can see all these big red dots, which is the Gaza Strip and the casualties occurring there. And then you look at small dots and say, okay, this is what's happening on the other side. So very quickly, different stories can emerge and can add context to any story that you're covering. One of the really interesting things that we've done, you know, we've really, uh, this is something that Al Jazeera has been the first news the broadcaster in the world we have done, is we've taken all our footage from Gaza and we've made it freely available to any other broadcaster, any other blogger, anyone else out there in the world, any newspaper online, to take our footage and to use it as they wish, without paying us a cent. So they can take it commercially or non-commercially and use it. Um, and this is something that's never been done before by a big broadcaster. And it's really an experiment that we just launched a few days ago to see what happens, because we want to only international broadcast of English in Gaza. We've, you know, we cover this is our turf. You know, and this is what these events in this region, you know, where all the hotspots are: uh, Palestine, Iraq, Somalia. These are places where Al Jazeera are, or used to be, in Iraq at least, where we have depth of coverage. So, what happens when we take these pictures and make them available to other broadcasters? And we want to see what they're doing with it. And we've seen really interesting results from this. We've had requests from South America down to Asia of other broadcasters saying, hey, we're using your footage. We're going to be putting it on tonight. We're going to be putting it on our websites. So just look at what happens when we do this as an experiment. But finally, you know, and this is something that I think it really comes down to the heart of what we do um, and what everybody in this industry needs to remember. It's not about technologies. It's not about the latest mobile phone. It's not about your internet connection. At the end of the day, it's about the person, the reporter who's on the ground, who's in that war zone, or who's in the field, who has an understanding of the story, who understands the context, who understands the historical nature of these conflicts, who can add depth to the story when you report it. Because everything is not just a photo that gets taken. Because that's, not, that's just a picture, it's a snapshot. It may not be an accurate reflection just because it's a photo that gets taken. There's depth around it. And in order for our audiences to really understand these stories, they need somebody to explain it, to crystallize it, to put it into context. And that's what we do. And it's these brave field journalists that we have who are courageous, who go into the field, who bring these stories back to us. So any of the innovations that we do, all those nice projects that I showed you in the previous slides, build upon their work eventually. And you know, we're going to see these changes and other people reporting and all of this, and which is exciting, and we're very adept at being there and building upon it. But at the end of the day, the success of an organization like Al Jazeera is built on its field journalists of having 70 uh, bureaus and locations across the world of just having people on the ground who understand local cultures, understand the local languages, and can go and report on there and bring back that news. So, I think uh, my time is up. So let me just end here. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have a nice discussion after this. Thank you very much.